This video illustrates the proven antecedent strategy. Proven antecedent is a strategy and not a rule. That means it's something that we do on a regular basis and so I've given it a name so that we can refer to it. Probably the best thing to do is jump in and construct the proof for this argument and we'll talk about the way this thing works as we're going. Okay, so we know how this works. We always start at the top and do all the uh, apply all the rules that we can top down. So let's look at these lines. Line one, the main connective is an arrow. We obviously don't have tilde A arrow B, so we can't work on line one. Line two, hey, it's an ampersand. Well, we know what to do with ampersands. Are you bored with ampersands yet? I'm definitely bored with ampersands. Two ampersand out, done twice. Okay, we could check off line two. There is nothing else that we could do at the top at this point. Can't do arrow out on line one or four, and so we're stuck at the top. Time to go to the bottom. Single capital letter. Well, when you have a single capital letter, we know that we're doing tilde out. So let's make a big box here that occupies the entire available space. There we go. And just like that. Top of the box, of course, will be the opposite. So that's tilde D. It's line 5. And it's a provisional assumption for the rule tilde out. All right. Contradiction symbol at the bottom. We want to get to a logical disaster. Now we go back up to the top and see if anything's changed. Well, still don't have tilde A arrow B to do arrow out on line 1. Still don't have a C to do arrow out on 4. And that's all there is to think about. B and tilde D are both uninteresting. Okay, we're stuck at the top again. Stuck at the top, time to go to the bottom. When we go to the bottom, we identify the main connective. But we see there's no main connective here at all. This is a contradiction symbol. And this is exactly why we gave ourselves the proven antecedent strategy. As it says here, you should use the proven antecedent strategy when you're stuck at the top with a contradiction symbol at the bottom. So this is the situation which suggests that we need to think about this uh, strategy. Okay, so let's now talk about the steps of the strategy. When you're in this situation, the first thing you should do is look for a formula of the form P arrow Q arrow R or tilde P arrow Q arrow R. Notice what this is. It's something that has an arrow as its main connective and also has an arrow in its antecedent. Arrow is the main connective, arrow in the antecedent. Do we have such a line? Well, if we take a look at this, the answer should be obvious that we do. Line one, what's the main connective? An arrow, right there. And what is the main connective of the antecedent? It's also an arrow. So line one is an instance of these things. Now I've chosen this proof because this is the case where people oftentimes don't recognize that this is an instance. But, what is the P part of this formula? It's tilde A. And the Q part is B. And then we're designating the entire consequent as R. So P arrow Q arrow R. I've mentioned this in class, but I think this is worthwhile seeing again. Consider if you had A arrow B arrow C arrow D. Is this an instance of P arrow Q arrow R? And it definitely is. Now you might look at this and say, wait a second, isn't this an instance of P arrow Q? Yes, it is. But formulas can play multiple roles. In fact, we know that every formula is an instance of P. The whole formula is P. You can also think of it as P or Q. But for the purposes that we want, we can say, hey, it's an instance of P or Q, arrow R. 
Or we could think of it as P arrow Q arrow R. There are many ways to use a formula relative to some particular context or goal. So once again, to be an instance of P or Q arrow R, you have to have the arrow as the main connective, and then you have to have an arrow in the antecedent. Okay, so we accomplished line one. We looked for one of these two formulas, and we found it. Step two, pencil in the antecedent the P arrow Q part or the tilde P arrow Q part. Well, we know the antecedent is what becomes comes before the main connective in a conditional. So the antecedent is tilde A arrow P, and it says pencil it in in the middle. So let's do that. Tilde A arrow B. Let's also talk about why we're doing this. The name of this strategy is proven antecedent. And so what we're trying to do is prove the antecedent of line one. But why is it that we want to do this? The truth is this strategy is motivated by line one. When you look at line one, if you're just sort of doing the proof, thinking very mindlessly about it, you look at line one and you notice that it's an arrow, and you say to yourself, well, I'd like to do arrow out. In fact, if you're reading this in correspondence with the way I've encouraged you to read arrows, you're saying to yourself, if I could find tilde A arrow B on a line by itself, then I could write tilde C arrow D. What has happened is that we've gotten into, our, our, gotten into a place in this proof where there's nothing else for us to do but try to set up the ability to work on line one. And so we're saying, in order to work on one, I'm going to have to take this antecedent and pencil it into the middle and prove it so that I can do arrow out on line one. Let's contrast this really fast with something that you know how to do. If you saw A ampersand B arrow C on say line one in your proof, you know that at some, times you, some point you'd have to build A and B. But building an ampersand is easy. If you have the two parts, you just put them together. And so if you're trying to build an ampersand, you never get in the sort of difficult position that this formula can put us in. Here we need to build tilde A arrow B to make progress. And so what we do is we just pencil it in and now we're going to go back and prove it. In fact, notice step three. It says prove it using the appropriate rule. Well, what's the main connective of tilde A arrow B? It's an arrow. So the appropriate rule is, of course, arrow in and that's why we're going to make a box above it that utilizes all the space. In fact, why did we pencil this in in the middle? That was to give us space to prove it up above it, and then space to continue the proof below it. So, what's on line 6? It's tilde A, of course. And at the bottom of the box, it's B. And this is a provisional assumption for arrow in. And then we uh, go back up to the top and see if we can make progress. Every time you complete a box, you go back up to the top and look and see what you can do. Well, looking at what I've got here, there's nothing obvious to do, except notice what I'm after is B. And in fact, this is one of these boxes that once you've set it up, you're done virtually immediately. Because all I need to do is get to B, and since it's on line three, I can use our handy dandy repetition rule. I'm going to write 3R. I set up my box and it had B at the bottom. Well, as soon as I noticed that I had B up above, all I have to say is, well, I just need to repeat line three, and then I will have completed the box. The box proves the antecedent. Six through seven.
and the name of the rule, arrow in. Success! I have proved the antecedent. I just finished step three. Prove it using the appropriate rule. Now, why is it that we wanted to prove the antecedent? Well, remember, the whole thing is about line one. It's setting up the ability to do the arrow out. So obviously, the next thing is what it says here at four. Once you've proved the antecedent, apply arrow out to the original formula to get the R part. The R part is the R part of the original formula. So that's tilde C arrow D. Tilde C arrow D. Justification is of course one eight arrow out. Ah, oh, fantastic. Now all we have to do is get a contradiction and we'll be done and hopefully you can see that there's a contradiction available right now. A uh, quick question, is there anything that's off limits to me? And the answer is yes. Everything in this box is off limits because I'm down below it. You can never use a line inside of a box to justify anything below it. However, we're not even tempted to use this stuff because the contradiction that we're going to make use of involves 4 and 9. See? There's a formula. Here's the negation of that same formula. So let's put them together. C arrow D ampersand tilde C arrow D and we're done. It's a 4 9 ampersand in. And the justification for the entire thing is 5 through 10 and of course 5 was a tilde out and so that's what we have down here as well 5 through 10 tilde out we have completed the proof because proven antecedent involves these steps I know some people find this rather complicated but the key to it is thinking about the main purpose behind it when you have a conditional that also has a conditional in the antecedent, you sometimes have to go through this process in order to set up the arrow out. And that's really what's motivating this particular strategy. One final point that I need to mention, and that is that I, the way that I teach you to use proven antecedent is that you should only use this strategy when you're stuck at the top with a contradiction symbol at the bottom. But the truth is sometimes you can get away with using this even if you're not in that situation. Oftentimes if you have a conditional whose antecedent involves an, a conditional you can do this even before you're inside the outer box. But I'm trying to build a method which will do proofs as mechanically as possible. And so there's always creative ways that you can proceed, but I'm encouraging you not to worry about being creative at this point and just to, to do these things very mechanically. All right, I hope this has been useful.